Well, this is February 18th, uh, 1991, and as you're aware, you are aware, this is the uh, 1991 is the 50th anniversary of World War II. Now the Montgomery County Historical Society, in conjunction with the Byron Cox Post of the American Legion, has, is taking uh, this occasion or this period of time here to do a series of interviews of people who served during World War II. Uh, we uh, plan to do this over a period of time because we have so many people here in uh, this community who had interesting experiences during, during that war. Uh, our, uh, I am, uh, my name is Bob Wernley. Uh, I'm uh, here today on behalf of the Historical Society. Uh, our cameraman today is Ed Miller, who comes from the Byron Cox Post of the American Legion, and uh, with him today is Claire Chamberlain, who is, who is uh, helping us by lining up uh, people uh, in the community who had experiences in the war. Now, we plan to do a number of these, and as our first subject today, we are, we've selected uh, Dr. James Marion Kirkley, of Crawfordville, a local physician uh, who was in the uh, medical corps, is that right, Dr. Right. Kirtley? Right. During uh, World War II. Uh, now, uh, why don't we start out, Dr. Kirtley, by uh, having you tell us a little bit about your uh, local background, where your family came from, and, and where you were raised, where you went to school, and so on. Why don't you, why don't you just start out? Well, if I get too verbose, I stop. I'll, I'll, I'll back off. Cut you off. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I am a native of Montgomery County. I was born here, uh, July the twenty-third, nineteen ten, which makes me eighty years old, and uh, I've been able to survive that long, thank God. And I think this idea is, is great because we certainly do need to have a a verbal history, an oral history mm -hmm. of of what what happened during World War II. Well, I was born on uh, South Washington Street, just where the uh, Presbyterian Church uh, 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 school, uh, <laughs> Sunday school. Uh, and uh, I went to school here. My father was a dentist. Uh, he came from Johnson County, Indiana, and uh, met my mother at the First Christian Church, the Christian Endeavor, and they became uh, enamored of each other and were married uh, after he had uh, practiced here so from 1906. I was born, as I said, in 1910. My mother is Laurel S. Miller Kirtley, and uh, by the way, she was perhaps the first woman to be elected as city clerk in mm -hmm. this town. But I, I had my... Uh, You're women. a Democrat. I'm a Democrat, yes, I'm a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> One of the few in Montgomery County, as a matter I have a lot of Republican friends, though, Bob. <laughs> Otherwise, I could never be elected. <laughs> but we might go to the, the politics later. But anyway, I, uh, I went to the local schools, started out at Wilson School, and then to Mills, and, uh, and then to the uh, junior and senior high school. And... Uh, uh, then, following my graduation in 1928 uh, from high school, I went to Wabash College, where I got my uh, Bachelor of Arts degree in 1932. Uh, from I had taken a pre-medical course at, uh, at Wabash and was admitted. Who did you have for uh, science over there? <laughs> well, I had, yes, Lloyd Brelsford Howell was okay. the chemistry professor, and he was my mentor. He nearly flunked me, but I uh, finally made it, and uh, yes, he was uh, quite proud that all of his boys went to medical school. Most of his people were, were uh, pre-PhDs uh, in, in chemistry, and uh, we guys who were just trying to get by uh, went a little tough on us. Anyway, uh, I did go to Indiana University at Bloomington. In those days, 
the first uh, year of medical school was in Bloomington, and the last three years, the last two clinical years particularly, were in Indianapolis. And uh, when I graduated in 1936, uh, I received a uh, my MD degree, but also got a commission as a reserve medical officer. Mm -hmm. The way this happened, we, we had no ROTC in the medical school, but we did have a uh, lieutenant colonel from Fort Benjamin Harrison who had a course in tropical medicine our last semester of our senior year. And long about uh, early spring of that year, uh, he said, any of you gentlemen who are interested in becoming medical reservists, if you can pass a physical examination, uh, uh, you might be interested in being commissioned as reserve officers. So I guess perhaps 35 or so, uh, class of 90 so, uh, took up the challenge and uh, we were given our commissions then as reserve officers on the day we graduated in June of 1936. Well, my internship then started at the Indiana University School of Medicine uh, Hospitals and Riley Hospital, and the Long Hospital, and William H. Coleman Hospital. Uh, I had a, what they called a rotating in internship, which meant that we had uh, uh, work in all of the uh, all of medicine, including surgery. We didn't do any actual surgery, but we did assist, of course. And uh, it was more or less like the family practice uh, residencies of that mm -hmm. uh, we have now. Did you, uh, uh, did this uh, reserve uh, status require you to, to take uh, military training while you were? Uh, it did, and I, that's an interesting point. Long about uh, the end of my internship, just before I became a resident of obstetrics, I got a letter from the government saying, you have not kept up your work, and you're required to do so many hours of work or you'll lose your uh, reserve officer stand. So uh, I signed up immediately for what they called sub-courses at that time on military subjects, and I started sending those in. And then I think that the next year, 37, I had my first active duty as a res reservist, and I served as a CMTC camp physician. That's the civilian, civilian. Civilian Corps? Yeah, Citizen Military Training Corps, right. And I served at Fort Benjamin Harrison for two weeks. That was my first actual active duty in, in the mm -hmm. Army. Uh, then I served again at uh, uh, Carlisle Barracks, Pennsylvania, the next year, which is uh, was at that time a medical field service school. And then the, the following year, in 1940, I served at Fort Knox, Kentucky, uh, as a, a reserve medical officer. But in October of uh, 1940, I got a red bordered letter from uh, Fort Hayes, uh, Ohio, saying, First Lieutenant James M. Curley, you are hereby ordered to active duty if you get <laughs> past your physical examination. And they didn't give us a choice of what unit we should go to. And uh, well, by that I mean they said either uh, Fort, Benning, Fort Benning, Georgia or Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Well, I decided... Not much choice there. Not much choice. <laughs> well, you know, as a matter of fact, I thought, well, if I get to be a reserve officer, sign up early, I'll probably be back in the, some general hospital somewhere. Well, I was assigned to the 20th hospital group, but that didn't mean a darn thing when it was our active duty. So I, I would be ordered then to the 4th Infantry Division at Fort Benning, Georgia. I decided that as long as I was going I've been to, to Fort Benning. That's a great place. <laughs> I decided as long as I was going to go south, I would go as far as I could. So I picked uh, Fort Benning, and I'm glad that I did because I was assigned to the 4th uh, infantry division there, and uh, the 4th Medical Battalion, that was my first assignment. Uh, my orders arrived uh, in late November, and I was to report to, uh, 
to Fort Benning on December the 15th, 1940. Well, this was just a little time before Christmas, and I thought, well, why can't I wait and go after Christmas? So I uh, made a request for days. I, within two or three days, I got a reply that said, exigencies of the service require that you report as ordered. And I did that. <laughs> well, I have it. I got there on December the 15th at Fort Benning. And we promptly sat around. Did until nothing. Did nothing. For well, maybe did a little. We had some uh, classes, but it was all new completely. And uh, so I, but uh, we started then getting other reserve officers, and they were in the same situation that I was. And I became very close friends with many uh, medical officers at that time. <clears throat> now the. In those days, the uh, the army setup was a little different than, than it is now. We had what they called triangular outfits. By that I mean there were three infantry regiments, a complete regiment that was assigned to a division. And within, we finally ended up by having the the uh, eighth infantry regiment, the twelfth, and the twenty second. Now each uh, regiment then was broken down into three battalions and of, of infantry. But in addition to these infantry outfits, we had a uh, engineer uh, battalion, and we had, uh, of course, quartermaster. All the services were assigned so that we had a complete division. And we had about, I think at that time, our table of organization required us to have about uh, 16,000 troops mm -hmm. in one division. Well, in... Uh, Those are all volunteers. The draft hadn't started well, yet. Well, not yet, no. But no. It, it started very quickly. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I was going to say that my first uh, duty that really was more than our preliminary training was to be a, a train officer to get uh, selectees. Uh, from up north, and uh, so we went to uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey to get the first selectees, and that was in April of 1941. Well, my orders when I was ordered to active duty said, you will uh, serve for one year, and after this time you will return to your home at 1101 West Wabash, out of Crawford, Indiana. Well, of course, when I left my practice in the Ben Hur building on fourth floor, my friends, of course, bade me goodbye and said, well, we'll see you this time next year. And I said, no, I don't think you will. They said, why? Your orders say one year. I said, yes, I'll be in here till this thing is over, because it was very obvious that things were not going to be over very soon. Hitler was causing too much ruckus, and I just felt sure that are there, now, if you want to ask any questions, between them, I'm kind of rambling here. No, I, I, I follow along in chronological order. Right. And, uh, so you didn't get back. <laughs> no, I didn't. Sure <laughs> didn't. <laughs> well, we got our first selectees, as I said, and these poor fellows were absolutely flat. We got kids from Joyce and, and Brooklyn and that group, and they, they were just completely lost. But they were, they were willing to work, of course. So when we got them back to Georgia, then they they got their regular uniforms, and pretty soon they became uh, a very excellent uh, group. But these poor guys first got a lot of them had World War One uniforms with the high collars and the puttees and ro roll puttees. Yeah, I remember. That. <laughs> so they they were they were pretty visible. <laughs> well, well, training then began. After, after that, we had, uh, uh, of course, the smaller unit training, and then, of course, what we, by the way, it was 4th Division motorized at that time, which meant that we were completely motorized. We could carry every man on a vehicle. Nobody had to march at that time. And uh, 
Now the fourth fourth medical battalion uh, was a was is a, the supporting group for the evacuation of a wounded, of course. And our training, of course, was on first aid and then how to work with the infantry uh, regiments in order to get our plans worked out so that when we did get into combat, we would know how to, to support uh, these these units. Well, uh, of course, our maneuvers then uh, began later in that we were we went to South Carolina, we went down to uh, Louisiana, and uh, uh, let's see, put the put the whole uh, whole, whole, whole yeah whole, whole division put, yeah whole division on the train yeah at, no 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 they were all motorized okay I mean, but, but uh, I, I did want to say one thing about a, a rather an interesting thing I was I was attached to a chemical company. One, uh, one summer to go to the Louisiana maneuvers. And uh, <clears throat> on our way to, uh, uh, to Louisiana, we stopped at Vicksburg. And uh, everybody was completely bush by the time we got there. So there was tall grass in this, we stopped, by the way, on the Indiana Circle at Vicksburg mm -hmm. National uh, Park there. Well, the guys were just completely bushed, so they, it was, this was in summertime, and they just flopped down in the tall grass there and just died. Well, the next day when we got back to, uh, just on the road to Louisiana, they started itching. Everybody's dying of chiggers. Chiggers. It was <laughs> terrible. I tell you, we had to evacuate some of these kids. They, they, they got infected legs from scratching. And it was something else. Well, I want to tell this now. Uh, I found out that there's a way to prevent chickens. And uh, of that time, well, yeah, that's right. If you, before you go out berry picking or whatever, if you go, if you'll take powdered sulfur. And, and, oh yeah. Yeah, rub it on your legs or put it in your mouth. Well, I, no, this, well, this is rubbed off in your axilla and other hairy places. <laughs> it would actually prevent, you, oh, maybe you'd get one or two that would break through, but by and large, you, it would protect you. Well, then, as I, I had kept up on these sub-courses in the Army, uh, writing my examinations and so on, and, and, and I had... Uh, become qualified to be a captain. And lo and behold, I was finally promoted and I was one of the first uh, first attendants in the unit to, to, get to get to be a captain because I kept up on these uh, on this work. Well then, as things got a little more serious, uh, December the, the 7th, uh, 1941, there wasn't any question that, that we were all going to uh, stay in for the duration. But by the way, you know, that we did have several people who were sent home who had actually been dismissed from the service because they had served their year prior to that. Mm -hmm. But they immediately got letters to come back, and, and they, they did, of course. Well, let's see. <clears throat> well, uh, since I was, uh, by that time, the senior captain in the medical battalion, uh, new units were being formed all over the United States and cadres of men were sent out. And so you train a bunch of guys so they were pretty good and then lo and behold they'd be sent out to, to, to new units. So the 22nd Infantry uh, Medical Detachment then uh, lost its uh, commanding officer who was promoted and, and transferred. And I was the first captain to be sent to this unit. So that was my my new unit then was Medical Detachment, 22nd Infantry, 4th Infantry Division. Where were we stationed? Well, we were still there. Uh, we were at Benny. Benny. Well, uh, wait a minute. I didn't, I didn't get my promotion or, until we went to Camp Gordon. We opened uh, Camp Gordon, which is now Fort Gordon, near Augusta, Georgia. And uh, so I was assigned then to the 22nd Infantry. And that's been my claim to fame, I think, because that that was uh, a great 
we were near the front, front lines, as you know. I've been asked many times if, uh, well, did you have a lot of free nurses and did you have to make beds and all that sort of thing? I never saw the inside of a hospital any time during my medical service. We were on the field the whole time. And tents. Pardon me? In tents, yes. <laughs> if, if we had tents. Uh, uh, but of course, as the war, we'll go into this later, but as the war wore on, and during the winter time in Europe, uh, our medical detachment was usually in a house somewhere that mm -hmm. would be commandeered and, uh, so that we could uh, be in out of the cold so weather. So. Uh, let's see. Well, are we talking about maneuvers? Well, things were getting hotter by that time, and some of the units uh, were being sent overseas. And uh, the 4th Infantry Division was supposed to be one of the hot outfits. We were motorized, ready to move, you know. And uh, the general was ready. <laughs> and Who was your general? Uh, general Tubby Barton. <laughs> and okay. he's a great guy. Was he a major general? He was a major general, yeah. By the way, I, I think it might be interesting to, well, this to tell you about. When we were still at Fort Benning, <laughs> the uh, Georgie Patton, was given command, he was a, a brigadier general at this time, he was given command of the first, or the second armored division. The first was, had been formed at uh, uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky. But <clears throat> George got the second division, and say they were all spent and polished. Now they had to do things differently. We all wore our overseas caps on the right side, but all the tankers wore theirs on the other side to make them a little different. Well, he sat a highway, ran to the side of Fort Benning, and the uh, Second Armored Division was across the road from us. Well, we'd been having some bad accidents on that road. The road was rather narrow, although it was blacktop, but people were driving too fast, and nearly every year, every week, somebody get killed on that road. So uh, Lloyd Friedenhall, who, who was the commander of the uh, Fort Benning at that time, put out an order that nobody would drive that road faster than 35 miles an hour. And anybody that did, he didn't care who it was, would be come to him person or be arrested. Well, you know, the first Old guy that Patton got it. Patton got it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he was livid. He tried to he tried to tell those MPs who he was. They said, sorry, sir, but we have our orders. And uh, so he did it. He went to General Friedendahl, yes, and uh, he said, I'm sorry, but that's, that's my orders. And of course, later, Patton was just a bad in Europe. He would uh, arrest anybody that he saw without a helmet, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that was kind of interesting. But he had a good outfit. He really, really worked with it. But Friedendahl later became commanding officer of the Second Corps. And if you remember in North Africa, the Second Corps kind of took a whipping at them when they first got into Africa. And it turned out that George Patton, uh, Friedenhall was relieved, and Patton took over the Second Corps. Right. But so I guess this was the, uh, what, what do you say, poetic justice or something like that. <laughs> and let's see, where was I? Well, why don't you tell us about uh, when you started to move overseas? You All right. Are you getting there? Yeah, we'll get to Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's see. 19. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, my wife came down to visit me. She'd been ill for for several years. Uh, we dated during our uh, when we were she was in nurses training. No, not a woman. Uh, at the medical center, and uh, she'd been ill, and but she did improve so that she came down to, to visit me in uh, uh, February of, of 1943. And, well, things were getting pretty hot by that time. You didn't, you were still in the States in 43? Oh, yes. Yeah, that's right. We, uh, we, we kept getting alerted, but nothing would happen. You know, we'd get the alert. And so we decided that maybe if we're going to get married, we'd better do it while we're still around. And so we were married on 
February the 14th, 1943, at the, in the Division Chapel at Camp Gordon, Georgia, which was on Tobacco Road, by the way. There was a road sign up there that said Tobacco Road. So we're, we were really uh, Georgia crackers by that time. Well, as I said, we these alert things had happened, and we packed up even uh, once or twice, and they sent some some of our rolling equipment by train to the north, and then they de-alert us. But uh, we finally were sent to Fort Dix, New Jersey, for training, and uh, then we sat around all that, that summer of, of '43. And as a matter of fact, the there was a labor shortage there. So our training had sort of slowed down, and, and the canning companies were desperately in need of, of helpers. So uh, they agreed to let soldiers work in the factories uh, with the, the, the regular wages. Then. So General Barton said, all right, since so many of our people are working in here, we're going to call us the 4th Division Tomatoized. <laughs> They're picking tomatoes and and working in the factory. So that's where we were. All right. Well, from <coughs> Fort Dix then, that fall, uh, we moved to uh, Camp Gordon Johnson, Florida, Camp Carabelle. Now, this is where the amphibious training was given. And uh, we really had it. We went out in the flat bottom boats, and then we had one LST there. And uh, we were supposed to learn how to make shore landings uh, after coming out and putting us in the Gulf and, and moving in line. Uh, it's said that we did lose a few men uh, who got swept away in, in rubber boats, but I didn't know just exactly what the truth of that, but it, may, it could have happened because the, the water was rough down there, of course. But after we'd, we'd had that training then, then we did get our real alert. And my wife had come down to uh, uh, Tallahassee, Florida, and I had to send her home by plane. And by the way, she was pregnant and sick as the dickens. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I hesitated having her fly back, but it was the easiest way to do. And uh, she said later that she felt pretty sick, but she finally made it back to Indiana. And uh, so then we were sent to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, for staging. Now, staging meant that you were given new equipment as needed, and all of the men who were physically incapable of being in combat were weeded out. Well, they had a, a whole regiment of men who had been uh, uh, organized and had from selectees, of course, and these were taken out one by one and put in as replacements for these men that were found to be physically unable mm -hmm. to, to go. And uh, then we got more new equipment, of course, and then we went by train to, uh, uh, well, I never can think of the name, for an embarkation point. Uh, who, who was the the road trees? George Kilmer. George Kilmer, this Camp Kilmer. Camp Jersey. Kilmer. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, we stayed there for about three weeks. We learned how to... Uh, abandoned ship, but they had uh, cargo nets thrown up over the barracks, and we had to climb up and down these cargo nets to, to learn how to uh, either bend the ship or get onto our landing craft. And we had uh, gas mask training and uh, first aid stuff and so on. But then finally the, the day came that we were ready to board ship. Uh, everybody was uh, we were ready for we were battle ready. We were all given helmets, or we had a helmet, but they all were painted with these red crosses. And I, you see, I have a number on the top there, and identification number, I suppose. And uh, that's not your serial number. No, that's not my serial number. No, it's not. <laughs> My serial number is 0345330. Not your social security number. Now. <laughs> but you had a chalk mark here. Your number was where you were in line. And you got on the train that way, and you got off that way. 
Well, we, we had to carry all of our equipment, of course, and I had a barracks bag and a heavy overcoat, and I tell you, I, I could, all I could do to, to lift all this stuff, but we finally got off the train and, and walked down to the, to the dock and, and got on this uh, ferry that took us across the Hudson River, and we got on the, our troop ship, which was a converted passenger liner. The, uh, let's see, the Cape Town Castle was here. It was later sunk, by the way, but, but fortunately we, we got along all right. And uh, I, being a, a junior major, I was in with another major, I, I had to have the upper berth, uh, upper bunk in this room. But it was very good. Uh, they were very good accommodations. But some of the, the kids were just in, Oh, the steerage, so to speak. It was, it was kind of bad. I went over in the steerage. Did you? Uh, you know what I'm talking about then. <laughs> but, kind of, well, funny thing, I'm, I'm subject to, to seasickness. And uh, it was all right the first two or three days. We, we waved goodbye to Miss Liberty and see Coney Island off to the left as we were taking off. But uh, the next day, things were, were a little rougher. So as we got, we went in a convoy, of course, and I don't know how many ships were in the convoy, but this was the time when the German wolf pack of uh, submarines were really knocking these, uh, and they were looking for troop ships, of course. But fortunately, our destroyers had really done a job, and I never did know that we had even had an alert, but uh, we we were thank, thankful mm -hmm. that we got into this kind of a convoy. <coughs> well, we... Uh, Oh, every day we had uh, submarine drill, or band ship drill. We had to get up on on the deck. Well, of course, that's what the rest of you guys had to clean up downstairs, you know, some, some of you did. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, I had a long, green, heavy overcoat, and of course my, uh, my helmet, which we had to wear. A couple on deck, and one day, uh, it was a windy, cold day, and uh, this, this green color, one of my sergeants came over to me and said, Major, your face is as green as that coat. <laughs> 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 but we survived, and uh, finally I landed at Liverpool in, um, in England, and from there took a troop train, and uh, by the way, one of the, we went to southern England, then, down in uh, Devon. But, see, we got into Nottingham about uh, all two o'clock one morning. And there the British uh, Red Cross gals were outside uh, with uh, sandwiches, which were about that thick and not very tasty, but they, they were ready to welcome the Yanks anyway. And uh, we, so we, we, as I said, we went through Nottingham, and I, we all want to know where the sheriff was, of course. We're looking for Robin Hood. <laughs> but uh, we finally went to, uh, uh, well, as I say, so, uh, I'm trying to think of the name. When did you land in, in England? What? Well, it was, uh, let's see, I think it was uh, d d uh, January. The last of January of, of 44. 44. Well, then after we were established in these uh, in camps in uh, southern England, and the division was spread out all over all Devon, uh, you had no unit that was very close to another because of the of the German bombing. Did you see any uh, German activity there? Yes, we saw a bit of it. We had. Uh, we captured the first German flyer. Some uh, uh, fighter got his uh, plane hit and he uh, bailed out over our uh, camp area and he was captured, so that, that's the first of it. Mm -hmm. But an aircraft fire was about the only thing that I saw, except for a bit of the training which was preparatory to the, to the final uh, invasion of Europe. And uh, we had a, a divisional exercise in which all of the landing craft were ready and, and we were 
an area called Slapton Sands was picked out as a an area that was as near the Normandy beaches that we could we could see. And I believe that this was before we were given the word where we were going. Later we were public called bigoted and we were taken into this secret room where all the maps were and so you knew exactly where you were supposed to go. But during this uh, exercise on slap in the sands, we didn't know about this until much later, but this, we, were, we did this exercise two times. But the second time, a group of German eagles got into our convoy along after midnight and sunk three of the LSTs. So we had our first casualties in, before, in April before D-Day. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but what, what was odd about this? What's an eagle? Uh, well, it's like a t torpedo boat, or, you know, like uh, J.F. Kennedy had. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were fast, and, and they, they, but they didn't stay around. They didn't really know that they uh, sunk these uh, uh, ships, apparently. They didn't try to pick up any of our survivors. If they had, the, the oh yes, the, the date of D-Day was known by us at that time. And you knew D-Day? Yeah, yeah. And when was this? Well, this was in April. Uh -huh. Well, no, I beg your pardon, not the actual date, but we knew that we were going to Normandy. That's, mm -hmm. that's the point. And so if any of our boys had been uh, picked up as survivors, uh, and the question which they would have been, uh, the whole thing would have been out to the Germans, but this this place was just absolutely frozen. In it. That you couldn't talk to any anybody about the exercise, and the hospital, I'm sure, that was uh, given the mission of taking care of our wounded was sworn to secrecy. And they said anybody that even mentioned that they saw a wounded soldier would be court-martialed. So they, and it was only until about oh seven or eight years ago that, that was completely. Uh, exposed. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they kept it secret that long, but mm -hmm. they did. Well, <clears throat> let's see. I'm really rambling here. <laughs> well, we, you've got us to this uh, exercise. All right. Out. Okay. Now, as I said, we we really didn't. Wait. How about the name of that operation? Oh. Operation Tiger. Uh, Tiger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Operation Tiger. And uh, let's see. Well, that was called Operation Tiger. Where yeah, you, yeah. When you when you slapped and practiced, practiced, practiced landing. Yeah, right. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. You practiced landing on the English coast. Oh yes. Yeah. This okay. Was, this, but you see, they picked out an area that was as near the Normandy coast as we were that we were going to invade. See, they mm -hmm. sim simulated as much as they could, uh, and so that they had a, a wide beach here and uh, not much headland. Back, of course. It, Fortunately, I'll tell you this later, Utah Beach and Omaha Beach are quite different, and I'll explain that mm -hmm. a little bit. But, well, we did some training then, but uh, we were primarily getting ready to, for the invasion. And a, a week before, uh, no, it was nearly a month before uh, June came around, first part of May, we were sent to uh, areas along the coast and the tents were pitched around the periphery of, of a field so that if a bomb came that they wouldn't hit many, many people. Uh, we were, uh, we didn't use any of our kitchens. That we were all fed by a, a outfit from the 5th Armored Division who was assigned just get us ready to go. Well, well, I should back up a little and say that the, when we got the uh, the word about uh, where we were going, we were taken in a few officers at a time and taken to this long barracks room where all of these uh, maps on the wall and where we were, and they had mock-ups of where the uh, German installations would be and so on. And we were, that was when we were told we were bigoted. And anybody who had been bigoted then could go into these secret places. But if you had not that word, then you, you couldn't. Well, June the 4th, we got aboard our 
train our trucks and took off to the hards. This was a place where they where they had these loading of, of the uh, of the vessels that were to be in the invasion. Hards. What hards. Well, that was what they called them. H A R D S. H A R D S. Yeah, they were cobblestone wharfs, really, so that you run the trucks down on these uh, to, to the water edge, and then these LSTs, of course, could could pick up these trucks and they were loaded uh, right off of this uh, loading area. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, as you all know, the first day that had been picked for D-Day was June 5th. Well, we took off on the 4th, and we were at sea when the bad storm, if a storm hit, and we were brought back in at a different port. So I think it was Portsmouth that we finally, uh, where we were pulled back in. And that was where we got our little uh, letter from Eisenhower saying that the invasion is on, and, and I still have a copy of that, uh, mm -hmm. of that bulletin that we received at that time. But we were given seasick pills, and by God, they did, they did work. Uh, they were mostly uh, a sedative and a atropin product which dries up your mouth and so on. But we were instructed to take these before we, when we went to bed, which we did, and so I don't remember pulling out of that harbor at all. And the next thing that I remember on the morning of June 6th uh, was hearing the our battleships firing on Normandy. And we could see Normandy in the distance and we had no trouble at all uh, getting over that far. By the way, we were loaded, my unit was loaded in an LCT, landing craft tank, which took uh, trucks, could hold tanks, but we didn't have a tank with us, of course, but two and a half ton trucks and pickups and, and jeeps, plus men. And uh, my jeep was the last to get aboard this uh, LC, LS, LCT. And I put a litter in front of the bumper right next to the ramp and lay down on this stretcher and slept all night. <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't know enough to be scared at that time yet. <laughs> but as I say, the next morning then we could see then these, uh, the invasion, uh, black flat bottom boats going in toward the shore. Now, the first... Uh, okay. Get us straight on this now. Tell us exactly what D-Day was. What day? D-Day was June sixth. Okay. It had been originally June fifth. Okay. And we had been sent out, and then were called back because okay. of the bad weather. Okay. And uh, so then we went out again on on the fifth. But I didn't. But really the infantry like, units and the armor went ahead of you. Oh, no, I'm part, you're, I'm part of the you're unit. You're part of the unit. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. an infantry, but this time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sure, we were supporting. We were part of 22nd Infantry. Okay. And uh, one of our uh, battalions was the first, the first ashore there. Now, there were two battalions of the 8th Infantry and one of the 22nd were the first ones on Utah Beach. Thank God for Utah Beach because, and this was the one that you remember that, uh, uh, well, General Roosevelt, Teddy, had pleaded with our commanding officer to be allowed to go. He'd been sort of uh, told that he, he just couldn't go, that he had a heart problem. And he said, they said, you're not combat ready. Well, being a general, I guess you can get, get by a little, but he, he pleaded with Tubby Barton and said, please let me go. So they made him assistant division commander, and he was given command of this first group that went in on Utah Beach. Well, if you remember the the flow of the sea at that time, took everybody about oh, a quarter of a mile away from where the beaches were supposed to be. Thank God for that, because there was a little curve in, in the beaches there, and the German guns back on Port Cherbourg were trained on that part of the beach. But the guys landed to the uh, south of that and 
without opposition practically. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were, of course they were sort of disorganized. Oh, what was the terrain like on your well, it was It was flat. flat. Okay. There was a, there was a seawall just inside, about oh, 50 yards inside the water line. And there was a sand, sand dune back of that. And then beyond that <coughs> were the, uh, what they call the inundated area, the areas that the Germans had filled up with water, uh, so that there were several what they call causeways, and of course the Germans had their guns zeroed in on these on these roads, so that if anybody came in, they'd be on the shell fire. But fortunately, the 20, the uh, 82nd Airborne, the 101st, had disrupted their them so much that they they were not. Were they uh, paratroopers or what were they? Then? Uh, well. Our, yes, yeah. paratroopers, right. Uh -huh. and, and they were scattered all over the Cotentin Peninsula, of course. Mm -hmm. They had gone in ahead. They had, they, yes, at mm -hmm. midnight, as you remember, they were mm -hmm. dropped in. Well, uh, General Roosevelt then said, well, we're in the wrong place, boys, but we're going to start it here. And he sat up on a sand dune and told, uh, by that time, the units were all together, and so he commanded them to go on, and they had their objective then, in a very short time. They were able to get across those causeways. Mm -hmm. Now that our 3rd Battalion of the, of the 22nd Infantry went up the beach uh, toward the, the big guns. Toward the guns. Uh -huh. and, uh, but fortunately they were, I guess they decided that they missed the boat anyway. They, they, they got up there without uh, too many casualties. So fortunately we did not have very many casualties on our beach. The first day I think the total number of casualties was 180 uh, out of 18,000 men. That's, that's and how many right. dead? Oh, I suppose half of those, pretty much. Half of those dead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most of them are wounded, fortunately. What kind of wounds were they getting? Well, shrapnel and oh. some small arms. Mm -hmm. Now, were you treating these people as they yes, came as back? It, uh, yeah, well, we were moving forward, see. Yeah, uh, but actually, you, that's you, what our job was. Yeah, sure. but, uh, you were, uh, what are you doing, setting up temporary... Uh, no, we, we were just first working aid? out of jeeps, really, and, you? Uh, and the aid kit, so we carried around our necks, uh -huh. uh, pet bandaged them, and, and we did have some uh, pl plasma, and a few of them got plasma, of course we gave them, uh, we had morphine serrets, uh, each man had that on him, by the way, that, that, so they could be used if he was in severe pain, and, uh, but when our, when the, when the ramp of my uh, LCT dropped, I was a senior officer there, and so I had to get off first. <laughs> so so I, I stepped off the ramp in about, oh, four feet of water, I guess it came up to right here. And, and my Jeep then was, was next off the ramp. Well, I had a little Polish driver who was a swell kid, Stanley Osowski. <laughs> He's a little short fellow. But Stanley gunned his Jeep. He had a trailer on the back of it, too. He went off that ramp and went under the water, zipped right up on the other side, <laughs> and got ashore. And we got all of our, our equipment ashore then from that. But of course, the kids always said that a lot of, a lot of these uh, LCT uh, navigators or drivers, <laughs> or whatever you call them, were limeys. And the, uh, our boys always said, well, the Limeys won't take you clear ashore. Well, they did. I mean, they were just as brave as our fellows were. But they didn't like to stay ashore very long. Of course, they wanted to back up and get off of that uh, beach as soon as they could. But once we got ashore, uh, we, we were up against the seawall so that we couldn't uh, be hit by any uh, incoming artillery. And the engineers had blasted a hole in the seawall and started a road up there so that our uh, wheeled vehicles could get up there. So pretty soon somebody said, well, come on, move on in, follow, follow the rest of the people. And we did, and I got up with my guys, and we got up on a crossroad just inside the, the dune lines, and uh, just then we heard some zzz, zzz, you know, and somebody said, get down, get down. We were the worst place in the world, stopping on a crossroads, of course. Yeah. And we were getting some small arms fire, but no, nobody got hit. But we saw our first German casualties at that time. 
at prisoners. Several of them were, were carrying wounded men in blankets. They didn't have any stretchers, but they were all escorted down to the beach and, and put in a prisoner of war compound and sent back to England, actually, on returning boats, of course. But then we then got across a causeway, across this inundated area. Marion, tell us, before we go any further, where is Utah Beach from Omaha Beach, and where is it from? Well, Sherburg is up here at the top. You know. Utah was next, and then Omaha. And it was going, about, going west or going east? Well, it's going south, really. Well, whatever it yeah, is. Yeah, anyway, we were about 10 miles from Omaha Beach. Mm -hmm. So we, we really didn't know anything was going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, we were busy enough where we were, but thank God that we weren't there. Oh, I started to tell you the difference between, you asked what the terrain looked like. Well, now Utah Beach, as I said, was flat, and you get above these sand dunes, and then across this water-filled area, you got into a little town. And it's, uh, it's, let's see. Well, what I then I want to say about Omaha Beach, they were right into a, a sort of like a half moon thing, with a high seawall, not, no, not a seawall, a natural, it was several cliff. Cliff, yeah. And the Germans had moved a division in, and they were shooting at those guys as they were coming in. Mm -hmm. And then that Point du Hulk was there, where the Marines uh, climbed that, you know, and, and got to the top and found out that the they moved their artillery, but they were they went ahead and captured the, the 88 millimeter guns that they had, had been there mm -hmm. prior to that. But, uh, but but one of the first things in these little towns, they, our artillery had knocked the steeples off of most of these uh, churches because they'd been using artillery observation posts. You know, the Germans had. You know. Yeah. So that was the first. Well, then we were escorted, and I forgot this little town, down toward, back toward the beach. And in a little, uh, app, this was a time of apple blossom time, really. And really, Normandy was beautiful there. With these, uh, the, one of the, the first things, of course, were these dead cattle, beautiful cattle in, in the fields, and they'd been killed by artillery fire. And two or three days later, they would become bloated, and it would turn over on the backs of their feet right straight up in the air, you know. It was, it was kind of, it was a terrible sight. Mm -hmm. But that, that first night, when we got down and dug in on the, on the beach, uh, I never... dug in right on the beach and yeah. slept there on the beach? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And, uh, and of course, the Germans were not attacking us. We were pushing them, of course, at that mm -hmm. time. But uh, it was, it, this was just getting stabilized first was the first thing we had to do. But what I would start to say, the beautiful tracer bullets going out at that time. We we had a, an occasional German plane came over, I guess, but we had no bombing right then. But the anti-aircraft boys were seeing to it they didn't come there, you know, and they were just shooting mm -hmm. tracers and it, it just uh, lavender and yellow and white uh, tra tracers going up, you know, quite a sight. And so, of course, the present. Uh, Movies that we're seeing from uh, Saudi Arabia now. Are same thing. Of, yeah, same mm -hmm. thing. So now we're you were we're ashore. Sleeping for you were you were we were bedding down, down on the beach. So that's right. Okay, go ahead. June sixth, nineteen forty-four. Okay, well, as you know, the German resistance increased as we. The idea was we were supposed to cut across the Kotem Peninsula. Uh, we, the, we, there were three divisions that were supposed to do that, and, and uh, Mary Cooper's, uh, out, well, he wasn't a member at that time, but his 90th division, uh, no, he was, he was the 80th, I think, part, but uh, the Texas Oklahoma division was the 90th, they came in behind us, and then the 79th division, uh, our mission was to cut across and then go north and, and take the Take Sherbrooke. Was this was supposed to be done in what seven or eight days? Well, it took well, 25 days, I guess, to do it mm -hmm. because 
even though the Germans were not maybe first class troops, but they had a lot of ammunition and they, uh, and they did a lot of firing. And we started getting our casualties, of course, too. What kind of reception did you get from the populace? Oh, it's just they were happy to see us. They, of course, they, they were trying to protect themselves from all the shooting, of course, but, but we were welcomed with open arms, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Uh, they they brought us eggs or anything. They, of course, in, in that area, uh, they have Calvados. Now Calvados is <laughs> well, you can burn it just it'll burn just like that. Was it manure? Kerosene. No, Calv Calvados. Well, I've never heard of that. Before. Oh, you did. Well, there's a Calvados uh, area in Norman. Okay. And this is uh, cider. Apple cider. Oh, this is where all these apples grow. Okay, I'm learning something. Yeah, about. and the cider then was allowed to ferment, and uh, of course it became a very potent liquor. And uh, we've always got a little of that too. You know? <laughs> but well, finally, after some tough battles, uh, we did uh, capture Cherbourg, and then we turned. Back, we went back the other way, got ready to go through through the St. Louis breakthrough, and uh, but we had by well, that time terrific casualties. We were having a lot of people killed, and uh, he was doing a lot of work. In the yes, well now, yes, my 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 battalion aid stations were were really busy, and they did a wonderful job. Now, did you do any of the, or were the aides doing most of this work, oh, yes. or were you? No. Well, Actually, Bob, I, I have to say that my, although my title was regimental surgeon, it was largely administrative. Now, I'm not trying to say that I, I didn't do any. I, I had a Red Cross Bazaar, and I was a doctor, and I did treat a few wounded. But we didn't have the gross number of wounded to come through our little regimental aid station. It was primarily an, an administrative post, you see, because mm -hmm. we were right with the regimental headquarters. But the battalion aid stations were the ones that took care of the wounded from the field. Their, their stretcher bearers went out and pulled the guys in to a, a tent, usually, mm -hmm. where they were given uh, first aid, really, and uh, splinted and uh, given something for their pain. And then the collecting companies picked up, they evacuated the wounded from the battalion aid stations back to the uh, clearing Company, which was part of the 4th Medical Battalion. Now the Clearing Company was more definitive. They could do some surgery and, and did, but behind them then was a Mobile Surgical Hospital. Still in France? Still in France, oh yes. Okay. This was on the beach. On the beach. But a lot of people say, well, you had mass units. Well, we, we didn't. Mass units didn't come about until Korea. Uh, but these were Mobile evacuation hospitals, surgical hospitals. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they did more of the definitive surgery. But of course, uh, many of those wounded were sent back to England by LSTs because mm -hmm. they, could, they had better facilities back there. Well, where'd you go from there? Where'd well, uh, after the the breakthrough, the breakthrough at St. Louis, there was a highway called Perrier's Highway and we had to we line up along that highway and the Germans were fiercely resisting our attempt to go toward Paris for this time. But after about, uh, let's see, the 25th of July, by the way I got notice, let's see, it came about uh, oh, June the 25th that I was a father. <laughs> my, my son was born at uh, Methodist Hospital in Annapolis. Uh -huh. My wife was fine. But Which son is that? That's David. David. Huh? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so I was a new daddy. But after this, the St. Louis breakthrough was something. Now this is where Estelle Bell uh, came in with the... Uh, Well, the 29th Division, I guess, and he was he was wounded, I believe, in that St. Louis breakthrough. But uh, well, after we broke 
the line was broken, then we just kept moving then toward Paris. And you mean the, the Falaise Gap, you remember that was closed, and the Germans gave up in, in mass, really. But they did save enough of them that they were still like a, a rattlesnake that you could count on. <laughs> They're not striking at you. But anyway, as we moved then toward Paris, uh, we, the beautiful, beautiful country there, and the cathedrals had not been injured along, along the road there. And we got to uh, time enough to, to look at a few of them. But one of the big things was that our division was the first to get into Paris ex after the second French armored division. They were given the honor of being first in Paris. General de Gaulle? General de Gaulle, yeah. Okay. And, uh, but we were along the, uh, the Seine River, and uh, so everything was, uh, the Germans were not giving much resistance there. So I, I'm afraid I broke some rules, and we took a jeep and went into Paris at, at night of the 25th, I believe. And, of uh, July? Was, was it July? Or August. It must have been August. You didn't get in that soon, did you? Well, yeah, we were the first there. Now, whenever Paris was liberated, we were the first to. Mm -hmm. But what I started to say, well, I did get to go to the Arc de Triomphe that, that first night, and then we pulled back to where we were. The next morning, the big parade started. And as we got to the outskirts of Paris and started moving in, the crowds started getting better, bigger, and louder, and throwing flowers and kissing the boys. <laughs> I tell you that 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 was a thrill. We we finally got down to the the place, well, the, the city hall. Yeah. And it was a madhouse down there. And it, what a thrill to be the first troops in there. Yeah. It was terrific. Well, we were we had an assignment on. Board. Were you and you were on board a vehicle? Of course, I was on my you Jeep. weren't marching. You were. You no, we had we were motorized. Yeah. Yeah, we were still yeah. motorized. Yeah. So we, yeah, I had my, my Jeep, was my little Stanley Osowski was my driver, and we, we enjoyed all that. I, uh, now let's see. Then after we got through Paris, and as I said, our, our mission was to go as far as we can beyond the city. So the, the 30th Division, which later became a very well highly decorated me, was given the honor of having their picture taken marching down the Arc de Triomphe, uh, placed along Concord, you know, uh, and that their picture is on that stand. But here we, we'd been there first, but you'd think that the first guys got into Paris, but we were. <laughs> well, well, let's see. Well, after so that. We're going east from Paris. Uh -huh. East from, toward, uh, we went very rapidly then. We, we got through Luxembourg and then into Belgium and then into uh, uh, when we were, our regiment was the first troops into, into that part of Germany too. By that time we saw the first dragon teeth, you know, and, and the Germans were not occupying that time. We moved into those dra dragon teeth. But then we pulled back after that. The dragon's teeth, why don't you tell us what those are? Well, those were concrete uh, tank traps. <clears throat> they were uh, oh, six-sided, I think. Concrete about oh, six feet high and put close enough together so that a tank couldn't get between them. And the idea was to stop tanks on the outskirts of them so that the artillery from the Germans could then uh, stop them completely. But, uh, and then of course the pillboxes were there to the concrete. But they had evacuated. They had evacuated that, that area where, where we were. Mm -hmm. Then we went back to, to Luxembourg and uh, then some bad fighting then from then on toward, as we were moving toward uh, the east. And uh, then eventually as fall came on we were we were in the Hertford Forest, and that, that was a, a sad thing, of course. Uh, we, we lost many men there, and uh, this is where Marion Cooper comes in. But that's the time he 
He was a member, I believe it's the 83rd Division. He was a captain uh, of a company. And we had been out of a, in and out of a little town called Yay, G-E-Y, uh, all two or three times. And couldn't hold it. The Germans counterattack, and then our guys had to pull back. But Marion Cooper and his company finally captured that town. <clears throat> then the next day or so after we had been, we were let pulled out after we'd been in there for about a month. We were pulled out and went back to, to, to a quiet period. <laughs> in Luxembourg, we were spread out along the, uh, a river there for 50 miles now, that the, the division was uh, disposed of as, as a guard, which it was just kind of a screen, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, did you, uh, uh, when you speak of all this fighting, were you within, were you, were you back from the fighting or were you right yeah, there? Yeah, I was there with the front lines, except going up to visit my aid station. But we had artillery landing in our area all the time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Any small arms fired? No. no. Uh -huh. you, but you know, in Normandy, you could hear those the burp guns. They were all the, the Schmeisser uh, machine pistol. And they, the reason they called them burp guns was because they sh shot in short bursts. They go, burp, 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 burp. And there wasn't any question you what they were. You could, you could hear them off mm -hmm. in the distance. Was that a, a, a that small arm? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. they're about thirty caliber, I guess. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. German, uh, thirty or nine millimeter. Was it? Uh -huh. <coughs> now we're, uh, we're we're back in Luxembourg now. All resting. right. Yes, rest. <laughs> okay. All right. We spent Christmas Day in a little in a uh, priest. This would have been forty four. Forty four. In a priest's home. It was very nice. And, by the way, uh, uh, Ernest Hemingway was attached himself to our unit at that time, and his wife, just then estranged, had not told him that she came to visit him. <laughs> at, uh, at she was a war, war correspondent too, you know, and uh, so we always kind of laughed about that that deal. But I I saw Ernest Hemingway, talked to him a lot of times. So. And he would treat it for cold wood. <laughs> but so I started to tell you, the Battle of the Bulge started here. This was uh, after Christmas, you know. And uh, one of our, we were holding the, the south flank of the whole Third Army, or First Army, because uh, that Bulge battle uh, transferred us from the first to Third Army, <laughs> because they came right down the the corridor which separated our two the two units, and one of the Twelfth Infantry Regiment was a little town called Echternach, and they held up the, the German uh, drive enough so that they they could have some organization behind. Them. Uh, let's see, the Tenth Armored Division was down at Metz, and uh, so Patton ordered them to come up and uh, hit the flank of the Germans, the Ron Rundstedt's flank. And they, they came up a boiling and, and really uh, were able to, to do some real good damage. But you remember, these, we were a little, little town one day called Spa in Belgium, SPA. And this was a core headquarters for us. Well, they had, uh, uh, why don't you turn it off a minute, uh, Okay, I want you to take a break, but i got to change batteries. Okay. okay. <laughs> Probably well, need to rest, stretch it. Uh, yeah, my right. lord, it's, <laughs> why are you talking this long? Well, you know, this is just exactly what we're trying to get. <laughs> I, I think it's pretty good, don't you, Dick? Don't you think it is? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I've enjoyed every minute of it. A lot of, <laughs> lot of stuff here that people don't know about. Well, I'm not very... Of course, you ever got to get them shot. Well, 